Um, uh, it's a real honor to be here today. Uh, this is uh, being at the Day of Learning has been a bucket list item for me since the beginning. Uh, so uh, I'd like to start off now um, with a story for you of two boys. First, meet Mike. Mike is 13 years old, has an ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder Diagnosis, and is in a mainstream school, or at least was before COVID. Uh, he does pretty well in his academics, but he doesn't have many friends, according to his mom. He doesn't report this, though, and says he's doing just fine socially. He says he'd be happy to meet a group of new kids because it could be fun to meet some new kids, I guess. Now meet Bill. Bill presents the same as Mike in terms of diagnosis, schooling, and even how he interacts with other people, his cognitive functioning. However, he does report that he does not have friends and is really distressed about this. He said he's nervous uh, to meet new kids because he doesn't know what they'll say about him or, or what he'll think of them. So of course, the well-worn phrase in the ASD community, often attributed to Tony Atwood, is if you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And that that is everyone with ASD is different. And of course, that's true. But it can also make things very scary because it leaves uh, individuals and families guessing as to what might work, what might help them. I hope to show you that we can do better than guess. So one guess that many families uh, make is that their kids might benefit from some kind of social skills group with some peers uh, with or without ASD, but do these things work? So my team and I uh, recently conducted a study called a meta-analysis where we pulled all of the randomized control trials of, of uh, these kinds of interventions together to ask the question, does it work? So this is a graphical representation of the meta-analysis. You don't have to know what it means, uh, what all the lines mean, but essentially overall, the finding was that the effect was, uh, was modest, but, but there. Um, and the effect was kind of similar to the average uh, effect across all child and adolescent uh, group treatments, and it varied a little bit in terms of based on who you ask, whether you ask a parent, an observer, or a task. So, um, you know, that, that's promising. But, but going back to Mike and Bill, they responded really differently to a group intervention. Mike went to a group and said he had a good time, reported learning a few things, didn't really seem to change in terms of what he actually did, according to his mom or according to himself. And it didn't really turn out exactly as his mom had expected, but he said he'd be fine to do it again. Bill went and struggled at first, seeming really anxious and taking a while to really engage with the group. He said he didn't really learn much, but he did make some friends according to himself and according to those friends. And his mom reported him uh, to be more social and less anxious, but he's not so sure he'd want to go back. So this gets back to an important question. Wouldn't it be good to know what would work ahead of time? and to bet cater it to those, uh, to, to what uh, Mike or Bill would actually prefer and enjoy. So our first clue in terms of how to start to do this comes from Mike and Bill's self-report, their own report, and from that previous meta-analysis. In that meta-analysis, uh, we also asked kids, that we also looked at when kids themselves reported on how these interventions are going. And they reported with a really large effect. This effect was a bit larger than the effects of cognitive behavior therapy uh, on social anxiety and 1.5 times larger than the effects of medication on social anxiety. This is a big change. But then we zoomed in and said, well, what are they telling us is really changing? And uh, when we looked at the actual things that, they were, that, that were being reported on, we differentiated between changing things they know and changing things they do. And what we find is that the effect was almost entirely attributable to kids in these social skills interventions saying, I know more stuff, but they're not necessarily saying that they're doing more stuff. So there's this increase in what's called social knowledge, but not necessarily social performance. And as it turns out, this is not much of a surprise since most social skills interventions focus on training social knowledge. Recent work has actually started to disentangle the two and focus on different treatments for each, but that's a topic for a little bit. First now, we want to know something about how we can know what's better for whom, for Mike or Bill. What kind of group, or even no group at all? Well, it turns out this is not a problem that's unique to the field of autism. Uh, 
In fact, going back decades, uh, Paul Meal famously did many studies showing that, uh, that when we try to make clinical judgments about this versus using actuarial judgments, actuarial judgments often do better and clinical judgments often do worse than chance about these sorts of issues. Uh, the late Tris Smith brought this idea uh, among others, brought this idea to the autism field, and that's been followed up uh, in many important studies in recent years, which have showed that we can actually predict that even in evidence-based interventions, some kids do better, but we can actually predict that some kids might even do worse. And this is based on the idea of looking at what are called mediators, which are baseline uh, factors that can tell you, uh, that can predict whether or not somebody is going to improve or get worse in the course of a treatment. So I'm going to tell you about a couple. So one of them that we've looked at is um, this idea of insight, or essentially, do you see your social behavior the way other people see you? And we found, uh, first of all, that many kids with ASD are kind of like this kitten. Um, they rate their behaviors bigger or, or better or different than, than other people rate them. But importantly, that discrepancy between themselves and others matters for predicting treatment outcome. Uh, we found in one study actually that those whose uh, perceptions kind of aligned more closely with those around them actually did better over the course of the treatment, even at follow-up. Um, we also find a, a similar uh, uh, kind of pattern uh, our team looked at in terms of comorbidity. So we looked at uh, kids with ASD, ASD and ADHD, ASD and anxiety, or all three. And we found that those who have uh, anxiety and ASD actually did the best in some of these interventions. Those with just ASD did kind of moderate. Those with ASD plus ADHD, or even all three, actually did the worst. Uh, and some even got worse over the course of some of these interventions. And we started to move now into looking at this at the level of neural metrics. So using that EEG technology that Jamie told you about, those caps on the head that tell you about the brain signals, we were able to detect markers that are associated with anxiety. So here's uh, the first one is telling you about a little blip that happens when you make a mistake. Uh, the second one is telling you about uh, some neural patterns about approach and avoidance. And what we find is actually the our team found that the magnitude of that blip when you make a mistake, as well as that approach avoidance pattern, actually tells you whether or not in the course of a social uh, skills intervention, kids improved in terms of their anxiety or got, actually got worse in terms of their anxiety. But up till now, most of this, this research has only focused on one predictor at a time. And of course, kids involve, uh, uh, have many more than one predictor uh, happening uh, at once within them. So uh, in another recent study, uh, our team looked at kind of aggregating these factors together. And what we're starting to do is see whether or not these aggregates, we're calling these, these bundles of uh, profiles uh, that, that can create profiles of uh, social cognition and social perception, that we can perhaps then use to tell you in that bundle for your child or for yourself whether or not a group might be helpful. We also in the past have only used one intervention. So recently we started to do studies where we actually try to disentangle that performance focus versus that knowledge focus, interventions focused on one or the other. And in a recent kind of a randomized control trial, we did exactly that uh, and compared the two. And what we found uh, was something, uh, our team found something quite tantalizing, which is that um, some of those very biomarkers that Jamie was talking about earlier change in terms of the inter these different interventions, but they change differently based on which intervention you're in. You don't need to know how to interpret this graph. All you need to know is see is that those lines, those, those slopes of those changes from baseline to endpoint to even 10 weeks after the intervention are different. Um, but importantly, they both seem to help in different ways. So both groups uh, show uh, showed effects, knowledge and performance groups, in terms of changing, uh, for in terms of helping kids make friends, but they do it at different rates. So this suggests, again, that our different types of interventions, which lead to different outcomes at different rates, and they can, we, we're moving towards being able to predict differentially for different kinds of interventions, what's worse, best for whom. Importantly, some sense of the features of interventions we've started to find do cut across regardless of what you're doing. So the strength of the relationship uh, with the therapist or the setting, or even a setting where kids feel matched or kind of similar to their peers uh, in terms of uh, their own social presentation or uh, in terms of, of the things that they're looking for out of social context, those matter. And so this is moving us towards uh, an important goal, which is not just evidence-based interventions, but evidence-based choices. Uh, giving uh, kids and families the abilities to say, okay, what do I, not just what, what do I want to do, but do it without just guessing. So perhaps then we can start to better predict who will do better and who will not. 
and even which type of intervention they, they might benefit from most. So we could tell you, for instance, that Mike uh, might have fun, gain some knowledge, but not necessarily change as much socially in this intervention, but maybe he wants to do it and that's okay. Likewise, maybe Bill, we can tell, we can tell Bill's family that even though it's, he's you know, struggling or anxious at first, that, that that challenge might be worth it. And that the reward in social performance and friendship might actually be something really meaningful for him. Which again suggests, even though if you know one person with autism, you just know one person with autism, that's not to say that we can't learn from the experiences of others to make that one person's experience better. And of course, for some of you, you might be listening to this and thinking this sounds familiar. And in fact, it is. We're, we're drawing on the, the old principle of evidence, the, the, the three-legged stool of evidence-based practice. That evidence-based practice is really based on a combination of clinical experience, clinical research and evidence, and preference. And if we can pull those things together, we can move towards what I consider kind of the holy grail of this particular area of the field which is an evidence-based menu, being able to say, not just guess among everything, um, but rather uh, we can start to, uh, let me tell you five or six things that based on what we've learned up front might be best for you. And then you pick the one that you, that you want the most, that you think will be the most fun, that will be the most rewarding, as well as the most effective. So again, I hope that means that with, with that kind of approach, we can move towards doing better than just making a guess. So I just want to take a quick moment to thank the funders of some of the work I told you about today. Uh, I want to thank the wonderful collaborators on some of these projects and of course my fantastic team of uh, graduate students and staff and postdocs in particular, uh, Aaron, uh, Tammy, Tessa, Kara, Alan, Aaron, and Jackie who uh, were featured in some of the presentation, uh, some of the slides you saw. And of course to thank all the wonderful families who contributed and made this work possible. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you for highlighting that this intervention approach is not a one size fits all approach, that it shouldn't be a one size fits all approach. And I also want to um, specifically highlight the work of Kara Kiefer, who's an ASF funded fellow in your lab. And we thank her for all her hard work she's done in, in research in your lab. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, there was one question about the specific social skills training program. Um, is there, you know, you mentioned there's a wide variety of them. Um, was there one that you utilized um, in your set of studies? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so we've done uh, a number of randomized controlled trials over the last um, 15 years. Uh, and and we're, we're kind of in the business of, of not um, picking horses and horse races, if we can avoid it. So what we do is we try to think for any given study, what's the principle we're trying to test? So there's an intervention uh, that our lab developed called STARI, Sociodramatic Affective Relational Intervention, which is really very much what I would call performance-based. There's very little kind of didactic teaching. There's very little kind of rules teaching in it. Instead, there's, it's about creating kind of context where kids can perhaps be socially successful. On the other hand, um, there are many interventions that, you, that are out there that are really are about teaching social rules. And again, I wanna be clear, there are kids who we find benefit from that and, and, and are looking for that kind of information and, and young adults and adults too, by the way. And so what we do is we'll often kind of compare those two in any given study. So in the one I shared, showed you there, we were comparing STARI to kind of STARI without the specific training activities uh, to see whether or not they would if, uh, differentially affect some of the outcomes that we've, we looked at. And of course we found that they did. And what is the role of parents versus therapists in uh, working on social skills? Yeah, really good question. Um, I think that this, uh, it, it part, part of the answer is that this is of course a developmental question, right? So as with typically developing kids, um, right? When you, um, I have young children at home and I work quite a lot with them uh, on supporting their social uh, activities because they can't do that much without me anyway. Uh, uh, and um, as they, as people develop over time, you know, one of the the uh, tensions is providing that ongoing support and providing uh, facilitating autonomy. And so I, I think that you know, in many ways, the answer to that question is based on where any individual is in that in that developmental process. And what's hard is that for many kids with ASD, where they are, where, where they are, you know, we found and where they kind of want to be is very different. Uh, Bill, for instance, in the example that I just gave you, 
you know, he wanted, he wanted things to be going differently than they were. And so often uh, working with the parents to either uh, provide context that can be success, uh, supportive or even better, just provide feedback, you know, about what's working for them. Uh, can make a can make a really big difference because you know many many of uh, many kids on this on the spectrum um, may struggle to integrate that information effectively to then make choices about what they want to do next. Um, we have time for one final question, and the question is: um, Now that we kind of accept that there's not a one size fits all approach. Um, what do you think the barriers to dissemination and implementation of all these different interventions might be? So if you do have a menu of different interventions, how do you anticipate that those get utilized or how therapists or clinicians or even insurance companies make decisions about which ones should be utilized? And they could be based on, you know, you looked at neural markers. And so maybe that's one of the decisions, one of the ways that it gets decided. Yeah, it's a huge question. It's many, it's many huge questions. We could have a whole day just talking about that, um, right? Um, I, I mean, I think there are barriers at the level of, of awareness, right? So there's barriers at the level of people knowing even that, they're, that the array, array of things are out there. There's also barriers in terms of access, right? So I can tell you, having lived and worked in different parts of the country, there are different regional, there's different regional availability, even of interventions that we consider evidence-based. Um, and so uh, some people may not know that there are, is an evidence-based menu or that there are options for them, in part because where they live, there really might not be. There might only be one or two people offering uh, uh, services. So, you know, that gets to issues of, of training and dissemination that, that you know, many uh, leaders in the field are, are starting to look at. Uh, now is how do we get that information out to to providers as well as families, um, and and then you get to sort of you know bigger implementation issues of fidelity and then as you said payment right because um, right now we don't have I don't think um, a a funding model for many interventions that's that's able to that's nimble. Uh, in response to the kinds of developments that are highlighted at places like the Day of Learning. Every year at the Day of Learning, we're learning new things. The field is advancing, as Jamie said earlier, really rapidly. And so I think one thing we need to think about at a policy level is how do we, without putting carts before horses, um, create a funding system that allows us to uptake new findings about what the science has told us and put them into practice effectively uh, and 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 understand that what what's what we consider evidence based is not uh, an uh, um, impermeable rock, but it's something that's growing and changing over time as we do more of this work. Um, we have time for one final question. Sorry, um, in your okay. studies, has IQ made a difference in the the, the implementation? Yeah, so it's an interesting it's an interesting question. Um, it, this again gets to differences between sort of clinical implementation questions and and research findings. Um, I would say, from a research standpoint, we haven't found all that much in terms of uh, variation in IQ predicting predicting changes. Um, what I can tell you is that is that clinically, um, when we run some of these groups. You know, we find that obviously things like ability to engage with and understand the activities, you know, that, that can matter. But often it matters in different ways than we expect it. We have certain, certain ones of these performance-based interventions that if I, if I guessed up front, if you, and again, this is where that clinical judgment piece, uh, you know, where we really need to be humble about our own clinical judgment. If I guessed, here's somebody who I think might really struggle to understand what we're trying to get at here. Um, I've seen those, some of those kids actually do the best particularly in terms of doing things like uptaking and practicing skills, being engaged to take them forward. And, and also, by the way, something not, that's not trivial, enjoying it and actually getting something uh, positive social about the experience of being with peers who they feel connected to. Thank you so much. We're going to let you off the hook now. 